Nashville, Tennessee, Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you so much for all the love. It was great to see you all out there. I really appreciate all the support. I am bringing the Night Pants Nation tour to Boston, March 31st to April 2nd, and Minneapolis, April 28th through the 30th. Get your tickets for those shows and all shows at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. I can't thank you enough for your support. It's been a hell of a year so far, and we're going to continue that run. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a huge help to everything we do over here. And the Patreon, it's called the Honeydew with y'all. I'm highlighting the lowlights with y'all, the stories are unlike anything you've ever heard. I promise you that. It's five bucks a month. If you sign up for a year, you're getting over a month free, and you're getting the honeydew a day early ad free at no additional cost. All right? That's the biz right there. You guys know what we do over here. We're highlighting the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. All right? Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have the legend back, the one and only Joey Diaz, everybody. Welcome back to the honeydew, Joey Diaz. What's going on, Ryan Sickler? The Russians are coming. I, God damn it, they are, boy. How about Holy that ghost shit. of Kiev? Dan Van the Kirk what? told me about this guy last night. He's called, I think it's the ghost of Kiev, they call him. And he's a fighter jet that shot down six Russian jets yesterday alone. And they can't get this guy. They can't see him. But he's like the Red Baron up there right now in our times. This dude's like a badass, and he's knocking them all out of the sky, and they can't fuck with him up there. He's like he's like the Tony Hawk of fucking fighter pilots. What a fucking nightmare, my friend. For real. We just got COVID. Now we got a fucking World War, War Three. Yeah, after COVID. Is COVID over? COVID's over, though, isn't it? Seems like it happened. Jesus Christ. Nobody gives a fuck yeah, anymore. Seriously, they're bombing people. We got to worry about a mask. <laughs> That's it. They're not talking about vaccines no more. Nothing. I heard they're letting people into New York without the card. You know, it's over. Of it's course they are. Listen, there's no way the United States of America is going to tell people that you can't fucking come here and, and you know, save your fucking self. There's going to be a lot of looking left and right when it comes to that shit. Blind eyes and yeah, yeah, compassionate souls. What the fuck are you going to do? That's a, they're, they're, over. Their capital's fucking, getting right. bombed. They bombed yeah. the airport. They bombed the air. Imagine being in L.A. right now. And you're like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And they're like, they bombed L.A. Actually, like, well, how am I getting the fuck out now? I got to drive to Vegas. Burbank or some shit. All right, brother. We have not done one of these since July of 2021. When we last ended, it was uh, it's actually very touching to me now because it was March of 97 for you. I had just moved here on valentine's day in, in 97 and you just got passed at the store and for me i'm sitting here right now i'm newly passed at the store so it's nice to by the way it's nice to be able to go on that wall with you someday joey diaz it's uh it was 25 years the anniversary was 25 years last saturday it was on my birthday all right. i became a wreck on my birthday okay it all came together, you know. Yeah, you you were mentioning that you went in, you didn't want to touch the toilet with your hands, so you fucking sat the lid down and you sat there and you cried and it just all came out. Everything from back in Denver, back in Jersey, New York, all of it, the prison, all of it coming back to you and it just hit. Now you're a fucking regular at the world famous comedy store. So let's pick up March of 97 and we'll go from there. You know, the next day I woke up and I'll have to tell you how I felt. I felt invincible. I felt that I belonged. And I'm happy that I got to do this now because it's given me, you know, I've been doing stand up. It's going to be a year now. It was a year yesterday or something since I haven't been on stage. So it's given me a lot of time to think, you know, and the, the best times I had yet, it felt great to sell out theaters and, it felt great to sell out comedy clubs. That was great. Felt great to shoot a special. But there's nothing better than getting accepted into the circle that you're, you know, that you're going for. That's a great feeling. You know, I started in Denver. 
And then I went to New York for nine or 10 months, which taught me how to kind of start up in a city and get the party started. Then I went back to Denver and got the party started there for a year. And then I went to Seattle and got the party started there. So by the time you get to that fourth destination, you know how to get the party started. You know, by that time, I had joined an acting class on Monday night. Jamie Masada told me I wasn't funny enough to do his stage. Fuck that guy. But I had a guy who worked there who used to give me a 20-minute spot every Monday for Latino night. And it was packed. And, you know, it's so weird. People think you make it at the store and that's it. No, that's when your work starts. It's, I just did the... Comedy Store podcast last night with Eleanor, and she said the same thing. I said, "Look, it's, it's great. You're right. There's not there. I, I'm so, so surprised the camaraderie and um, how kind everyone has been coming up to me and congratulating yeah. me and stuff. You know, I, I didn't expect. First of all, I don't expect anything from anybody, but I really didn't expect that. I have been in that building for so long, doing so many shows, just never a regular that." It really, they, I, I see how much they appreciate it. So it, it it is something to be accepted by this band of fucking misfits. And, you know, you're one of us now. I really feel good about that. But you're right. A 15-minute set at the comedy store is, that's, a, that's all it is. It does not make you a comedian. An hour makes you a comedian. If you can go on the road and sell tickets, it makes you a comedian. Like, just being a comedy store comic is awesome, but it does. there's so much more, and you're right. That's where your work begins. Now you got to go to that next level. And you've seen yep. guys over the years do it. Pryor, Murphy, Robin Williams, just name them, all of them, you know? It's so busy how It's so weird how when you go to jiu-jitsu or karate, when you start, you're in the back of the class. And then after three months, you move up six spots. And then after three years, you're in the front line, you know? And it's the same thing at the comedy store. Like, I remember getting made and getting passed, not to, to get away from this. After I got passed, like, once somebody became a regular, we'd wait for them on the stairs. And when they come out, we treat them like the guys in Goodfellas. You pop yeah, your chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all hug you and rub your yeah, head. Yeah. I remember when Simone got passed. And we did that to him. You got made. Oh, yeah. shit. Popped your cherry and we hugged you. Not for me. For me, nobody said dick to me. But I remember the next day, <laughs> I got up and I went and brought Scott Dad bottle of tequila. He was the talent coordinator at the store. And I had a weekend that weekend when she made me on a Sunday. And that following weekend, I had a weekend in San Francisco. And somebody told me, dog, cancel that motherfucker. Because you don't want to get made and then disappear on her. And then she forgets about you. So I canceled it. And my goal at that time was to become a good comedian. But to be honest with you, the way you have to think when you walk into the comedy store or the improv, regardless of what you think or what's happened to you in your life, you have to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself five years. I'm going to be the best comic up here. You know, you got to sink in get involved at the store, do all the belly room shows for people, the more exposure. That's right. So my world had become the comedy store. I was, you know, the felonies got expunged. That expunged everything. That was. What that year, when was that? In, in, in 97 also? <clears throat> 97. Yeah. No, no. I'm saying that the becoming a regular took away all the sins. Got it. It took away a lot of the pain. You know, it took away a lot of things. Now my fucking goal was to become the best at the store, you know, and to move up the ladder from the one o'clock spot to 1015, you know, and yeah. I'll never forget Monday. I got a spot that Monday, my first Monday, they gave me a spot like at 11 o'clock. Boy, was I fucking happy. I got Josh Wolf. I got my other buddies. I got, T I got Brody. Everybody came down to see my spot. Monday night, comedy store debut, ready to fucking go. And all of a sudden, Eddie Griffith taps me and he goes, hey, player, do you mind if I do 10 minutes in oh, front of you? And I'm like, dog, you stayed on to a quarter to two. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know spot. if Eddie Griffith's ever done 10 minutes. <laughs> dog, I, went, 
went from the biggest high in my life <laughs> to the biggest low in my life. Did you if still you get to go? By, if you would have come by and fucked me in the ass <laughs> and shoot me, it would have been the best thing you could have done. <laughs> I was just sitting back there ready to cry. And my friends kept saying goodbye one by one. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it was Let it go, man. <laughs> we'll see you next time. And I'm like, fuck. And then finally, Eddie Griffin goes, "Hey, right, you coming up here, Cuba? And I remember walking up there, like, ready to shoot myself. I wanted <laughs> yeah. to kill him. I wanted to kill him. I think I went home and cried again. You go from this biggest high to this gigantic fucking low in 24 hours. And that was okay. It teaches you. It teaches you. I was used to it already, you know, getting bumped and people telling me they're going to do 10 minutes and they're up there for two hours. So then, you know, I didn't have a, I had a girlfriend. We were kind of at, at war. You know, we had found a place in Hollywood and it was getting myself familiarized. I, I got an acting class on, uh, on Monday nights over on Gardner on the other side of sunset behind the guitar center yeah get what the guy's name was because after like three weeks on monday it was it was seven to ten and after about three or four weeks the guy said to me by the way is anybody a comedian here and i didn't say shit and he goes i hate fucking comedians you guys come in here you think you're the cream of the crop i can't stand them the last comic i dealt with was fucking andrew dice clay and he put a left <laughs> A bad taste in my mouth. So I was like, fuck. <laughs> now he's doing Woody Allen movies. So Monday nights was the busiest night in Hollywood at the time. They were fucking, you know. It was the Laugh Factory Latino night, back. Crazy Monday, whatever it was at the improv, back. And the comedy store had an open mic. But after 10, you go down there and sign up on Monday. So you go was to get a triple crown on Monday nights. To get a spot at the Improv, to get a spot at the Lab Factory. So for months, I would get spots every fucking Monday at the Lab Factory with Gilbert, Felipe, Willie Barsena, mm -hmm. Carlos Mencia, Pablo Francisco, Carlos Oscar. That was that crew. And then I would go to the comedy store and hang out, you know, and, Couple, I was hanging out in the daytime with Doug Stanhope. I would go to Doug's house and write with him and try to learn what the fuck he was doing because he was on a different level in 97. He had turned the face of comedy, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to switch it up a little bit from the fucking, hey, how are you doing? You know what I'm saying? All that shit. So I was hanging out with Doug in the daytime, and then that circle became Doug and Mitch. So it was me, Doug, and Mitch Hedberg would meet at like wow. two at Doug Stanhope's on Curson, and then we'd walk to Gorky Park on Fountain, the Russian I, Park. I'm gonna say, but yeah, they, I'm gonna say this. That's were, three very different voices of comedy getting together, unlike anything, at, especially at that time. Even still, now it's it's still no, yeah. I, man, I, that time, guy. I, especially I'm, Mitch Hedberg too. He's still yeah. one of a kind. He is still one it of was, a kind was already in montreal yeah people know who mitch was doug had, was tearing up the country and i was like a feature act learning from the both of them just listening to them talk and we would play tennis that's when he wrote that joke i'll never be as good as the wall in tennis, <laughs> yeah. you know? You know? he was a motherfucker <laughs> he was and man. then add he to was. that he lived next to he lived on sierra bonita next to motherfucking nick DePaulo. Okay. They were neighbors, and Nick wasn't crazy about Mitch Hedberg because of the long can, hair. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and the guitar playing. So uh, Nick would bang on the wall, and Mitch would tell us, you know, that fucking Nick's in a bad mood today, you know, whatever. But it was something that, like I said, you could hang out with Pry and all this shit. That camaraderie will never happen again. Yeah, Josh Wolf was in the circle a lot. I was a lot with Josh in those days. Doug Stanhope lived on Curson, Mitch Hedberg, and Nick lived on Sierra Bonita. And then there was Gardner. And there was a friend of Doug Stanhope who lived on Gardner. And then Vista was Josh Wolf. 
So four blocks in a row, I would just wake up in the morning, go from door to door. You know, I didn't, I wasn't tight friends with the guy who lived on Gardner. But one day there was an emergency and he had to leave. And there was a fat guy staying over with Joey Medina. That was a funny guy. He was friends with Doug Stanhope. So Doug Stanhope put him in that building now. And that was Ralphie May. No way. So now wow. it was it was Josh, Ralphie, Nick, Mitch, and Doug Stanhope, five blocks in a row. That's <laughs> nuts. I know you when I eat. when I first moved here in ninety four, we used to get uh mail. It was off of Sweetser, Sweetser and Fountain, right there. You know. And we yeah. we would get mailed, it would say Andrew Silverstein. And it ended up that that was one of Dice's old apartments. And that was, well, I didn't know until I was a fan, it was Andrew, I believe it was Andrew Clay Silverstein, I think's his real name, I think it is. And we used to get his fucking mail. And that it, it hit me, I was like, am I really coming here to be a comedian and I'm in one of Dice's old places? Like that just, it just was a one of those things like, wow. Because you, you knew they all lived in that area if they could. There's the stores there, the improvs here and the left. That's that triangle. It's that little fucking triangle right there. All within what, like a mile, mile and a half of each other, tops? <clears throat> well, Josh Wolf lived in the apartment where Sandler's partner lived when he first moved to LA. No shit, yeah. He was getting residual checks from that guy for three grand, two grand. Oh, coming to his place? <laughs> yeah. The guy wasn't missing him. But yeah. what a... What, I was broke. At that time, I had a little bit of money left from a deal I got from CBS, and I basically moved to LA to fulfill this deal. It was a show on CBS called Bronx County. And uh, after about a month of being in L.A., becoming a regular, I mean, you got to remember, I became a regular in L.A. in less than a month at the store. Uh, that's amazing. 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 That's a fucking story. I, I, I wonder if you might not be the fastest uh, ever. I wonder. You got to be up there. You got to be up there. Be up. Yeah. I mean, some like Rudy Moreno, was doing a spot for Mitzi in the main room for Latino night, and Mitzi made him a regular. Shit like that, you right. know? Mm -hmm. But there's usually, like, a point that you go up there and you got to, you know, hang out before you become a regular. I was there maybe five nights before I became a regular. At that, at that point in my life, I didn't have the mental capacity to hang out. If I'm not working, I'm not there. I always said there's no reason to go to a club and hang out because if you do meet somebody, they're going to ask you, when are you going up? And you're going to go, not tonight. I'm going up at Anthony Chang's Dumpling Palace. You know, right. so, so yeah. what, <laughs> Dumpling Palace. what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah. So that's why I never really hung out. Everybody always says you got to hang out and talk to people. Fuck you. You want to talk to somebody, join a Lonely Hearts Club. I'm going out at night to do spots. And I remember that every day I would fucking call people to give me spots. Like, you know, a couple people had rooms in, in the Orange County, but the most noticeable guy was Rudy Moreno. Yeah. He had a room at the Brave Bull, like the comedy store. It was basically three fucking rooms. And he would book three rooms on a Saturday and Friday. I must have called him for a fucking month till I was blue in the fucking face and he wouldn't return my calls. So I borrowed a car one night and I actually went to the Brave Bull. And I go, who's Rudy fucking Moreno? And they go, that. And I go, how fucking day you not call me back? I could see if I was some white animal or something, but I'm Spanish like you. White animal. You call me back. I'm and he's like, okay, okay, I'll put you up. I love it. I love it. He's and great too. Really? I, I did a lot of his shows at the Ice House early on coming really? up. He 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 really did hustle and booked a lot of shows, gave a lot of comedians uh spots. If you're waiting for the right time to buy your first home, I've got news for you. Things are only getting crazier. Rents and house prices are skyrocketing. Interest rates are going up, and no matter what stage you're in, you should start planning now. I look every night out here. I check 
Zillow. I check Westside Rentals. I check Apartments.com. I check Craigslist. I check all of them. Rents are insane. The cost of living is insane. Okay, I recommend that everyone listen to the How to Buy a Home podcast. This is an incredible free resource with everything you need to know to navigate this process. Host David Sedoni is an industry expert with years of experience who actually cares about first-time home buyers like you. And he answers questions like, when is the best time to start? How do I even start? Will a mortgage be more than my current monthly rent? Probably not. And the good news is he just released an emergency episode of How to Buy a Home all about the bidding wars of 2022 with insider tips and tricks to win. David has helped make buying a home a reality for so many people. He even connects first-time home buyers with great local realtors in their area so they know they have someone in their corner. I'm, I'm telling you, he can help you too. He's already helped a couple of you guys out there. So listen to the How to Buy a Home podcast today. David can help. Find How to Buy a Home wherever you listen the podcasts. For many people, getting financially healthy means dropping the weight of credit card debt, but where do you start when it feels like a never-ending cycle, right? Upstart can help you pay off your existing debt quickly and easily with a personal loan so you can start living your life. Whether it's paying off your credit cards, consolidating that high-interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score, so rather than looking at your credit score alone, Upstart's model, it considers other factors like your income, your employment, and other information provided in your loan application to find Find you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between a thousand all the way up to fifty thousand dollars. And you can even receive your funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash honeydew. That's upstart.com slash honeydew. Don't forget to use my URL to let them know I sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, your income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash honeydew. Now, let's get back to the do. Oh, he used to give me three spots a week. I used to torture him and work him. And <laughs> While he was on stage, I'd sit behind the stage and go, Rudy, 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 Rudy. I was just Rudy. But that particular night, about a year and a half, uh, maybe like three years earlier, I was at the Comedy Works. I did the open mic. And the guy that was in charge of the Comedy Works was a fucking sweetheart who actually changed my life around. I did a spot. I killed Three minutes, you know, and he chased me outside, this guy. And he goes, can I talk to you for a second? He goes, listen, we both know you're the funniest guy here without even blinking a fucking eye. But you don't take it seriously. He goes, look at the T-shirt you got on. You don't come to none of the writing classes. You're not involved with us at all. You just come in, blow the room up, and fucking leave. That's great. That'll work, but it ain't going to work for a while. Not for the long run. You got to write jokes, blah, blah, blah. And he told me, he goes, you know, you're a good comic, but this isn't what you want to do. You're not putting the right work in. You should just quit if you don't want to do this. And I remember I had my hands clinched. I was ready to knock this motherfucker out. Like, look at this guy telling me. And I walked over to the bus and I go, you know what? I am going to fuck him up. And I walked back to the comedy works in Denver. And I went downstairs and he wasn't there. And I remember I took a bus home. Then a month later, I got thrown out of the comedy works. It didn't matter. That dude, I bumped into him that night at Rudy's. He was a guy that worked with other comics and helped him. And at this time, he was working with Brian Dunkelman. Yeah. And he was bringing Brian down before Amer American Idol. I don't know what it was. So I went up on stage and I had a follow on like a top headliner. He's gone now. Tommy Drake or something. Tommy something. He used to be like a detective. I like my women. How I like my coffee with two tits. All that <laughs> shit, you know. <laughs> That's a good you know, one, like, I never heard that one. <laughs> so he was a funny dude. Well, I had seen him <laughs> evening at the improv a bunch of times. He would long detective jacket and like a hat. Yeah, you know, all that type of... I was talking to this day. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That type of shit. He blew up the fucking room. I was... My knees were fucking buckling. 
But then I said to myself, fuck this. Dude. I'm at the comedy store every fucking night following savages. At the time, there weren't the savages there were when I was there. But they were savages. You know, to be at the store after 1030, you got to be a fucking savage. And, and brother, I went up there and took that room apart at the Brave Bull, limb by fucking limb. And I got off and Rudy goes, you come down whenever the fuck you want. Just clean it up a little bit. And as I passed by Rudy, I saw that guy, Matt. That was his name, Matt. And he goes, what the fuck was that? And at that point, I accepted what he said to me. And I pulled him aside. And I go, you don't know how lucky you were that night of losing a fucking <laughs> I go, I'm a fucking nut. And you destroyed me that night as a human being. But when I got home, I thought about what your words were and you were right. And you're the reason why I'm here tonight. So thank you. And he gave me a big hug and I never saw him again. Matt Woods, Matt great Woods. comic. He came up with Matt Berry, Roseanne, uh, Todd Jordan, Rick Kearns. They were a fucking, you know, when, when uh, one of the country guys, uh, Larry the Cable guy, mm -hmm. wanted material, he bought all of Denver Comics materials. Oh, is that right? They were, yeah, they were great writers. All those guys. Uh, Rittenhouse with the hook. Yeah. The guy that had the hook up on stage. Fucking brilliant writer, that motherfucker. Uh, so it was great. It was great to see him. And But after I saw that guy and after I knew I could do it, because before you come to L.A., you hear all these negative things from comics when you go on the road. You know, don't go to L.A. You got to be a fag. You got to suck dick. Nobody will put you on stage. <laughs> Here I am, three fucking months, and I'm getting love everywhere. I got love at the improv before I got love at the store. I was already getting spot. There was a guy there named Cooper who was a talent coordinator, who was a drunk, great guy. And he saw me do a Latino night, and he made me a regular. And that now I was in the, the Laugh Factory. So it was, I was rocking and fucking rolling three months in. Now it was time to shoot the pilot. The director of this pilot for CBS, they gave him $3 million. So I thought this show was definitely going to work. You know who the director was? The guy who played the doctor in jail when the guy from The Sopranos was in prison. Wait. Remember John? Remember Johnny Sack went to prison? Johnny Sack, yeah. But Johnny Sack was in prison. There was a guy with glasses that was fucking making his bed and all that shit. That's the he guy? Was a, that guy is a badass. Man. He's also in Eyes Wide Shut, that dude. He's been in a thousand things. He directed it. So when I got there, I was playing a bartender that had, uh, he gave information to the cops. He was the eyes and ears of the neighborhood. He was a Spanish guy in the Bronx, you know. And I remember going to the rehearsals, and every time I would say a word or I'd act, people would shake their head. I was bad, Ryan Sickler. <laughs> so it was like two weeks of rehearsals. <laughs> every time I came, in, my lines got shorter. <laughs> shorter. Wait, hold on. You would see them shake their heads when you would do your line? <laughs> oh, that's brutal. <laughs> That's brutal seeing him out there just like God damn. It was terrible. <laughs> you know, I had never acted before. I'd probably <laughs> taken three or four acting classes by then. I was a lot better than a lot of other people because I watched a lot of TV, but so every time I went in, like Monday when I got there, it was nine pages of sides. When I got there Tuesday, it was down to eight. <laughs> Wednesday, there was eight again, but it was because they erased words and they made me just act like a fucking deaf mute. Like, hmm, hmm. Like, you know, hum, hum. Like, taking whatever. it away. <laughs> Changing yeah. your like, whole character now. Oh, uh, I, I went deaf in like fucking two weeks. By the last week, I was down to like two lines. Like, what are you drinking? <laughs> what are you drinking? That's all this motherfucker saying. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so fucking bad. <laughs> and for the guys at home, we just to let you know, man, you got to work at it, you know? And I remember by the time we shot the pilot, the fucking, they were down to one line. Like, what do you guys have? That was it. 
And there was rumors that if the show got picked up, they weren't going to pick me up. They were going to rehire somebody else. That's when I started stealing wardrobes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> when I know I'm not coming back, I start stealing shirts and underwear. <laughs> and socks. And at that time, I was living on cocaine. So I either bought underwear or I bought cocaine. And so I did everything fucking commando. I had holes in my socks. I didn't give a fuck. I'm snorting coke and I'm being a comic. By the time I shot that pilot, I was down to one fucking line. And I remember at the end when I was leaving, everybody was talking to me. They're like, yeah, see you. And everybody else is saying, see you soon. Not me. <laughs> they were like, see you. Good luck. I left there fucking crap. So I said, fuck it. I had this crazy girlfriend, a stripper, that used to let me choke her and light her pussy on fire. <laughs> and so I was up in her house up in the valley. But, but I, at that time, Josh Wolf gave me a car that belonged to a casting director that she lent it to him while she was out of town. And I started getting tickets on this motherfucker, right? I was getting tickets all over Hollywood. That little black chick with the fuck <laughs> was chasing me all over Hollywood. You know what I'm talking about? In the white car, that bitch is angry. Oh, she had dick since the fucking Nixon administration. <laughs> so I'm driving this chick's car. And I'm getting tickets everywhere. I got camouflage on the car. I'm putting leaves on it in fucking Hollywood. I come out of somewhere, I still get a fucking ticket. I probably have 50 fucking tickets. And I go up to this girl's <laughs> house. I just the pilot. They just give me like 10 grand for the fucking week. I'm going to go see my girlfriend up there. Well, she wasn't my girlfriend at the time. We had dated for four years. Now we were just fucking. She was a dirty whore, but I loved her. What are you going to do? And uh, I'm in there. We took a shower. I gave her a stab in the shower. And when I came out, my car was towed. <laughs> I was towed. And they towed that lady's car. And they <laughs> just said, my car. Out. Oh, without a fucking, without a title. <laughs> so they took everything. They took my fucking, my house got towed. Because at the time, <laughs> I was just living in my car. <laughs> my house got Ralphie May God beats me. And they used to say, your house got towed, cocksucker. <laughs> Everything, headshots, <laughs> demo reels, fucking clothes, oh, boxing gloves, a frisbee. <laughs> frisbee. Just... Everything. Frisbee. <sighs> All right, wait, I have to stop you for a second because Segura told me the story, and it's I'm jumping way forward because you're talking about how bad you were at acting, but you you did the Sopranos movie. Uh, and I just want to hear this story real quick. I, I think it was Segura that told me this about your scene with De Niro. You had a scene with De Niro. Yeah. And did did he just you were you were pretty like holy shit? I'm sitting here with fucking Bobby De Niro. Oh, that, was, that was Grudge Match. Oh, it was on Grudge Match. He did that. Yeah. Tell tell me yeah. that stuff because we're talking. Let's real quick. Let's give you some love. Cause go from watching people shake their heads at you delivering your lines to having. Uh, a scene with De Niro. I said Sopranos, grudge match. Tell me, what did he say to you when you sat with him? Because what are you sitting across from him? Yeah, well, there was a couple of things. You know, he, De Niro don't say much. You know, you got to beat him to get something out of him. So, like, I don't know what story he told you because I, I don't know. About this. I know. I know. He touched your hand like, I know. I know. That one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What happened is, you know, I went, when I got to New Orleans, I got there and I always read that Gene Hackman would always go straight to the set. He would never go in his, in his dressing room. And I thought that was interesting. And I read something by Gene Hackman that said he wanted to always be close to the action. You know, so when I got to New Orleans, I packed my shit in the room and I ran out of there and I went to wardrobe. And then from there, I go, where's the set? And I, they go down the block. We'll give you a ride. They go, you're not shooting. I, go, I would just want to go see, you know. And when I got there, it was LL Cool J. And he was in the thing that were getting ready. And all of a sudden, De Niro came in. And LL Cool J and De Niro are hugging each other. You know, they're hugging and kissing and fucking telling each other stories. I'm 30 feet away. I'm just watching, bro, trying to learn something. And they're like, all right, let's do, let's do this, guys. And they're talking 20 minutes, you know. They say action. De Niro walks up the fucking... LL Cool J and LL Cool J starts stuttering like fucking, you know, like spider. I mean, 
Cut. Action. Let's do it again. Action. Second take. Again. Fuck. I can't remember my lines. Cut. You know, and, and it was, and I noticed them. I go, what the fuck was that? I mean, LL, LL Cool J was rehearsing when I got here. They rehearsed the scene like five times. What is going on? I, I didn't think about it. The next day I get there. And sure enough, I sit down in the chair. And they come over. They go, you meet, you know, you meet Bobby? Yeah. I met him and analyzed that. I shake his hand. How you doing? Good to see you. You want to rehearse one time? Yeah, we rehearsed one time. It's just one fucking line. And it went smoother than fuck. And the next time, sure enough, action. The cameras are on. He comes up to me, bro, and I look at his face. (laughs) And you just don't see Bob Nero. You see Jimmy Conway. Yeah. The guy from Taxi Driver. You see the guy from fucking... Raging Bull. uh, Raging Bull. You see the guy from... The, the hunting movie when he goes to Vietnam, <laughs> get Christopher Walken. You know, you see this guy, and all of a sudden, you just fucking like, it's like you fizz out. Like you just hear the plug get pulled. <laughs> you don't know, you don't know who the fuck it is. And I was really, I was very self conscious. I go, hey, Robin, I'm sorry. And he like grabbed my hand. He's like, I know, I know, it's gonna be all right. He knows. He knows. Everybody stutters and shit. He around. knows that you're sitting here with Robert fucking De Niro, and it's going to take he you knows. a minute, but don't. <laughs> because it's to him with a thousand people. Amazing. That's the reaction. So he'll like break it down. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, you know, I'm like, I've done it with names who are yeah. fucking cracking. Because once you see his face, you just, you don't even know what line to go. <laughs> yeah. You know. Go home and get your shine box. Yeah. You don't know what the fuck. Yeah. Really fucking interesting. And then I, you know, after that movie, I got into a high-end acting class. I got into a Vanna Chubb because she had just won a Academy Award with Holly Berry. Mm-hmm. And then she won one the next year with Charlize Theron. So everybody said she was really good. And she was very good for character actors. You know? It was weird because when you first moved to Hollywood, you win some pretty big battles. But as you know, you lose pretty big battles. Also. Oh, yeah. yeah. And my internal battle at that time was I couldn't get representation. I had a manager when I first got to town, great guy. This is, I, I, I want to take this business after your house was stolen. You're still having trouble getting representation and all this stuff then? Yeah, I was having a hard time. I had this guy, Ken Phillips, for a while. Ken was a good guy. In fact, when I first got to the store, like three weeks into the store, I don't know what's going on. I'm fucking flat broke. I'm living hand to mouth, you know. And there's two fucking wannabe guidos at the store talking about their bookmaking. Right, they're bookmakers, blah blah blah. You know, I think they were friends with one of the Italian guys up there, and they're like, "If you ever want to put in the action, you know, let us know. Here's our number." And I go, "Sure." You know, I never thought about it. One day, I need money to do coke that weekend, and I'm like, "I like this fucking game tonight. If I could just get a book," and I go, "Oh shit, I know a book. Those guys, they live down La Cienega, right before you hit Santa Monica Boulevard." So I called them up. I go, "I don't know if you remember." Yeah. The Cuban kid, how you doing? Yeah, good. I go, listen, I want to put in, I put in like a $250 bet. If I won, I collect. If I lose, I tell you to go fuck yourself. You know, this was, and I didn't want to do this in LA. I didn't want to bring that part of my world into LA, you know, but I, I needed money and I did. And I fucking put the bet in on a Monday night. It was Houston. Given I, I two. love this. You always remember this. Go ahead. Tell and me. Like 25. You couldn't even write this shit. So the next day I call the guys and I go, hey, I want to collect. And they go, come by. You know, and I go, okay. And I go down there. And the guy says, uh, what we're gonna do is just give you 50 bucks. And I go, what are you talking about? It's 250. It was uh, I forget what it was. And he goes, Well, we charge you a hundred dollar fee to join us, and then a hundred dollar deposit, you know. 
and then you're good for the season. You know, and I'm like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? And they go, this is the way we do it. If you don't like it, get the fuck out of here. And I go, really? And I went right next door. Ken Phillips lived like the building next door, right by the 7-Eleven, across the 7-Eleven on Oceanica. Mm-hmm. There's a jiu-jitsu school in there. They used, no, there still is, Hollywood jiu-jitsu. And I'll never forget, went over to Ken Phillips' house and he had like a nine millimeter. And I go, Ken, I need to borrow your gun. He goes, for what? I go, I want to shoot a scene for a, a movie. I want them, they want me to shoot it. He goes, what movie? I haven't heard from nobody. I go, I'll tell you tomorrow. Let me just shoot this scene. I got to walk out of a car and point a gun in the bushes. That wasn't why I needed the gun. I was going next door. I didn't have no bullets in the gun. So I'm like, this is going to get fucked up, you know? I walk next door. I knock on the door. The guy's like, what do you want? I fucking rip out the gun. I go, listen, man, I've been putting bets in for 30 fucking years. Nobody has ever asked me for a fucking deposit or a fucking fee. A membership. I want my $200 or we're shooting it out. And this motherfucker. Dog, I was more scared than ever. I thought these guys were going to shoot me. The one kid basically started crying. (laughs) Ryan. <laughs> basically started crying. I was Man. like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. This fucking California is filled with guy had tattoos, gold chains. You know, he was the mafia. He barely started fucking crying. Please put it away. I'll give you the money. I gave him the money. He goes, You're never allowed to bet with us again. I, 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 I better not see you at the store either. You fucking thieves. That's how crazy I was when I got to the store. And then it's slow, you know. I didn't want to fuck up in California. But in the in my heart, I thought that my plan for California was simple. This is it. I'm gonna stay here till I fail so bad that I gotta leave like everywhere else I lived. You know? You believed you were gonna fail? Did you really believe that here though? Yes. You did. Even though I was a regular at the store and had all those things going for me, trust me, I've had a ton of things going for me before. I've been known to blow shit, but for some reason, I didn't want to blow this. You know, I was a fucking street hustler. I can make, I get anything. I, I can sell you anything on the street. So if I pull up to get a check and I see five cases of Jack Daniels, I just fucking see a Colombian. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would just see a Colombian with a mink jacket on, you know. I never stole nothing from the store. I never. I never really wanted to cause problems. And I got into fist fights up there. I bombed a lot up there. Like, I, I still remember in the beginning getting in my car and just crying and driving on Sunset and going, that's the last time I'll be doing a the spot there. Once Mitzi hears about that bombing, she's going to fucking, you know, I'm not good enough. But sure enough, the next week, I would get a fucking call, you know. Whether it's saving more and spending less, getting organized, or losing weight, there's a lot of worthwhile goals to set for yourself this year. And at the top of my list is learning a new language with Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. I'm working on my Espanol right now, and it's going muy bueno, y'all. Not only is learning a new language a fun and engaging new hobby, you can use it while you're traveling. The whole Babbel process is addictively fun, fast, and easy. Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons for real-world use, right? Look, for me, learning is repetition. And the thing I love about Babbel is that you'll they'll give you a lesson and then you'll redo it. You'll write it. You'll speak it. You'll go over it. You'll learn your accent, all of it, okay? Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and your accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. 
Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. So just go to Babbel.com. Use my promo code HONEYDOO, all right? That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com code HONEYDOO. Babbel, language for life. Today's program is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the health and wellness company that makes comprehensive daily nutrition really, really simple. With so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients it needs to thrive. We've got busy schedules. We're getting poor sleep, exercise, the environment, work stress, or simply not eating enough of the right foods can leave us deficient in key nutritional areas. I use a scoop of AG1 every day. I take a little packet, actually. I throw it in my water. Boom, I'm good for the day. I love it. One tasty scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more in one convenient daily serving. The special blend of high-quality, bioavailable ingredients and a scoop of AG1 work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, support energy and focus aid with gut health and digestion, and support a healthy immune system, effectively replacing multiple products or pills with one healthy, delicious drink. Join the movement of athletes, moms, dads, rookies, first-timers, and everyone in between taking ownership of their daily health and focusing on the nutritional products they really need in the simplest manner possible. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune-supporting free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash honeydew today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com dot com slash honeydew to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. Now, let's get back to the deal. When I moved to LA, immediately I got a manager that was a low rank guy, sweetheart of a guy. He was just getting, he was new, you know, and that's the biggest struggle you had. And I also had a great commercial agent, the best ones. I had Sutton Bartomenari. And this was all taken care of like in the first Six months that I was here, I had Sutton Barton Minari, I had a manager, and I was a regular at all three clubs. And I didn't really fucking know where I was going. You know, you're just trying to figure out. I'm talking to agents every night. I'm watching them at clubs, talking to other people, watching these other fucking stiff comics. So one day I got a call from Sutton Barton Minari, and they want to start sending me out for commercial auditions. They made me do like an hour workshop at the agency. And they started sending me out. My first audition was for Church's Chicken on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. And I, I you know, again, you're so naive. You think you're going to fucking get something, you know? And I kept going to auditions. They, I don't, in those days, Ryan, you were going to three commercial auditions a day. That's how different the the budget was back then like yeah. times were you were going on three commercial auditions a day you were probably hitting 13 auditions a week Damn. And maybe two, two three theatrical auditions a week that is what it was i would get a call friday that i had a commercial audition monday at 11 by the time i was leaving that audition on monday he would call me another audition 115 Go to whatever and go show them this. Oh, you got a 515 downtown LA. It was, it was fucking amazing. And we didn't know how lucky we were. We had no idea that that was as good as it was going to get. Ever going to get. Yeah. Ever going to get. We were complaining that I can't book nothing. And I kept going. I kept going. I kept going to auditions. I had already a, a TV show under my belt. But I hadn't, I couldn't get an audition for a movie. And well, I'm lying to you. Judy Brown called me in for an audition for the Jenny McCarthy show to be Chaz Palm and Terry's driver. Okay. She just thanked me for coming in. Thank you. That means you suck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm not mad at Judy Brown. She thought of me. And I had auditioned for a uh, Robert De Niro movie with Marky Wahlberg. It was uh, the Vinnie Curdo story. And I'll never forget that. Vinnie Curdo gave me a line on her, and I was so aggressive back then. Like, I wanted to go in for an audition that every Sunday night I would write her a letter by hand 
with a picture and a resume and tickets to the comedy store and the improv. And I would tell her I would have spots there during the week, call up, you know. And I'll never forget when I finally went in to see her after I died in the fucking room. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. She goes, oh, by the way, Ryan, can I tell you that she actually gave me a box of letters? I, have, I had sent her a box of letters. She could, it was just fucking folders. I would send her the eight by tens. She gave me a box. Back. The, how many I gave her. There must have been 40 envelopes. And she opened up the first one, didn't open up the rest of them. <laughs> and she told me that was very aggressive. And that's good that you're doing that. She goes, I'm not mad at you, but some people will get mad at you. But keep doing that. And I made a mental note, you know. So finally, I get a fucking call from Sutton Barkham and Ari, and they want me to read for this fucking tremendous. He was a, like the director of the year for SAG for commercials. And he was shooting a, a Taco Bell commercial in fucking Miami. So I'm like, what? I get to shoot a commercial, get paid, get my dick sucked, and start some <laughs> cocaine. I'm fucking in. <laughs> So I go down, I'll never forget, I went down on a Thursday, and they fucking loved me. They called me back on Friday. I went down there on Friday and rocked them, and they called me right after that, and they said, you're working Monday, uh, 4th of July. You're getting double rate, whatever. Kishka was his name or something. He goes, you booked the role as a taxi driver. All right. So Saturday, I had to go to wardrobe. They paid me for that. I stole a T-shirt. You know me, dog. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I used to love wardrobe because I would steal everything, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, uh, yeah, they called me Monday, seven o'clock call down at Abbott Kenny in uh, Marina Del Rey. Yeah, and we're there by the park. They built something on it now. It used to be a park, and down the corner was uh, the fucking pizza on the bagel bread and shit. It's still there. Good pizza down there. Anyway, I get down there Monday morning, and they're waiting for me. And they pull me aside, and they go, Joey, we're really sorry about this. Uh, you did great, but out of the three commercials, your commercial got canned. Oh. But they go, listen, never fear. Sit here for three days. We're going to give you 2000 bucks for the three days. You know, 680 a day, whatever they pay you. Plus overtime. Eat our food and go home on Wednesday. All right? Don't get mad. You know, you can read whatever you want. You can take a walk. Do whatever the fuck you want. I was like... You're getting a paid little, vacation now. Yeah, I was a little depressed. Yeah. You know, I wanted... So not 10 minutes after that, a guy comes up to me, sweetheart of a guy. His name is Buzz Bemundo. I don't know how you do Old that. school comic from the comedy store. In fact, he had moved on. He was there with Mitzi in the fucking beginning. He knew everybody, you know. His wife was an agent, and he was a writer, and he had taken to writing. So, you know, he was just doing commercials and stuff like that. He becomes my friend on the set. And he's got a commercial, a Taco Bell. They're shooting three of them. But now we're down to two. It's the first ones ever with the dog. Yeah. Yo quiero Taco Bell, that one. Yo, yeah. The first ones ever. So Monday I go down there, I work the day. I remember going back home, going to the comedy store, just being happy that I'm shooting something, you know. Tuesday I go there. I'm bullshitting with everybody at lunchtime. I'm fucking telling stories at the lunch table cracking jokes director grabs me after lunch and he goes hey man stay close to me all day i want you to change and stay close to me he goes i left the wardrobe in your room he goes i got a spot in this commercial i want to see if we can get you in there nice right. so there was also another comedian i forget his great guy he was a sag extra on the job which is not a bad job. It's 300 a day to be a SAG extra. So we're talking, we're bullshitting. The director comes over and goes, Joey, get in the scene. 
And I get in the scene, I'm there playing dominoes in the scene. Buzz is in the scene. And the guy is shining my shoes. Was supposed to be in Miami. The guy, I got white shoes on, the whole thing. I shoot with them. We have a great time. The dog walks by. We go home. The That's dog it. walks by. <laughs> Wasn't, uh, isn't it Carlos? Uh, I can't, I, that does the yes. voice, right? I, can't, I always fuck his last name up. Alza Rock. Yeah. 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 So I go home. I'm very excited, but I'm getting 2000 a month. Now I could front some Coke. You know what I'm saying? I got some fucking wiggle room and shit. And one day, out of nowhere, I open up my mailbox and there's a letter from the advertising firm that booked us. And in there, there's a fucking check for scale. And they go, Joey, thank you very much. You know, we're going to start airing your commercial next week. And I'm like, what? What fucking commercial? And they're like, we kept you in the commercial. You look great. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, shit. But I get a call. No, I didn't get a check. I'm lying to you. I just got a letter. Then my buddy Buzz calls me up, this sweetheart of a man. And he goes, Joey, did you get the letter? And I go, yeah. And he goes, fuck, I guess we didn't get into the commercial. What are you going to do with your check? And I go, oh, nothing. And he goes, yeah, they didn't put me in the commercial. I got cut from it. I was in the commercial. And he got cut. <laughs> it was his original commercial. <laughs> so they sent him a separate check and like, left you in. <laughs> they sent him a goodbye check. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, here, yeah, we fucked you in the ass. Yeah. Here's a little boy. Say la vie, cocksucker. And they gave me the commercial. Do you know I made eighty fucking thousand dollars from August 5th to December 31st? Did you just say 80, 80? Eight to eighty thousand dollars. I think Holy I made fuck. I made a hundred and forty thousand off that commercial. Dog, I couldn't check the cash. I couldn't cash the checks fast enough. A hundred and forty all in, man. That's a great one. Those were everywhere too. Everywhere. Well, that was the first set, so they didn't know how popular they were going to be. Right. So they kept fucking. They didn't know when to shoot again. So my commercial ran during the World Series. Yeah. Never forget being in Clark, Tennessee at an army base and watching my commercial on fucking during the World Series and shit, you know? I was really excited about that. But yeah, I ended up making 140 and then it was the commercial of the year and all the TV stations would vote it in and play the commercial. So I would get a check from that. Residuals on that bitch. Wow. No, I got but then I was getting residuals on the residuals and shit. Damn. No, you're a bad motherfucker. <laughs> that is a hell of a fucking deal. Because these, these days, you don't even get that. You get like a, a buyout. They don't even think they give you points or anything anymore. You just get like a motherfucking buyout. Thank you very much. See you later. Man, Carlos oh, must have made a motherfucking killing on that thing then. Bro, that dude bought two houses. I believe it. I and believe then, uh, it. interesting, because... I was getting to know my way around L.A. Everybody was broke. We were all struggling. You know, Ralphie, me, Josh. You know, the people that you see today that are rocking and rolling, if they were around in 97 and 98, they were fucking struggling. There was no Whitney. There was no Dalia. It was Rogan Ralphie's was young. Gone. <laughs> Ralphie's, Ralphie's gone. Ralphie's gone. Brody's gone. Ari was there. Duncan was there. You know. A lot of fucking, it was, it was an interesting time in comedy in LA. And I was just, I don't know, you know, you got to remember when I, when I tell you I made 140,000, I didn't have an apartment. It's not like I was buying cars and buying clothes. It was a party for me. My life was the comedy store, getting a gram or two of Coke and ending up in a hotel, sucking and fucking with a dirty waitress or some chick from a show or something. It was just, it was fun. I remember, I still remember living with Danny Kelly for a while on Sunset, which is like three blocks before Vista, and leaving his house with no money and fucking walking into the gas station and just putting my hand behind the counter and taking a pack of cigarettes. There was no fucking paying. 
I would just take a pack of cigarettes. You know, I would take a fucking soda. And it was just a scam every day. And, and if I didn't have money, Josh would feed me. If Josh didn't feed me, Ralphie May would feed me. Doug Stanhope would feed you. You know, looking back at it today, I don't know how we made it. I don't know how we. And then once me and my girlfriend broke up the stripper, I really, I really didn't have no where to stay. So I lived in that car for a while. I uh, stayed at Josh's couch. And when I went on the road, I got a hotel. That's when I could cut my toenails and buff out the skin under my nutsack. And, you know, <laughs> stay, you know until then you're roughing it. But dog, I, I still remember getting coked out of coaching horses and walking the God, business. That was a great rock and roll bar, coaching horses. And just getting in my car and pulling the seat back and opening up the sunroof and putting a blanket on. And that was it. That was my world. And I was happy as fuck. I was happy as fuck because I was in it to win it. You know, I was fucking in it to win it. But, you know, after she left, I had more more uh, action at the store. Me and my girlfriend broke up like at the end of 99. And, uh, you know, I was living in a hotel on Schrader the, the, where the where that place is where people do comedy now, you know, that place where people come from all over the world and stay there. When, when you travel abroad, oh, the, hostel. the hostel used to yeah. be a crack. That's where I was staying there when I got the movie basketball. Really? Yeah. So what happened was I'm still with Ken Phillips. I shoot the commercial, blah, 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 blah. blah. And then Ken Phillips calls me one day and he goes, there's an agency that's interested in you. I go, who? APA, UTA, CAA? And he goes, no, the coloring book. <laughs> That's for a kid's day. That was the name of the company, I dog. You want, you want to add insult to injury? <laughs> yeah. They, they were a fucking kid's agency, but she was growing to character actors, and I was her first adult. Your resume was all different pa papers. Like you had to make your resume on like pink, yellow, blue. Or orange paper, and you had to be. They had to be different colors. It was a nightmare getting your. I used to go to Doctor Fu, you know, the Chinese guy next to, uh, next to uh, the Mexican restaurant. They used to make copies for you there, and I used to go in there and make a hundred copies. She was a great lady. She was black. Her and her partner were black. It was a black agency. I mean, I mean, that's how bad things were. I couldn't even find a white agent to sign. <laughs> it was a black agent that signed me. They were a kid's agent. The, the, the hits just keep coming, guys. You know, I don't want you to think that anybody gave me anything. So here I am with the coloring book. I still remember being behind the comedy store. And people are like, I'm with Gersh. I'm with my like, whatever. I'm with the coloring book. All right, cop suckers? With the right. cop. Here I am with the fucking coloring book. <laughs> Different colored <laughs> fucking resumes and shit. Yeah. Fucking people, you run out of paper? Nah, man. That's just yeah. intentional. All these people complaining and shit. I'm playing it all out for you right now. <laughs> so I get a call one day. Oh, I had gone in for YPD Blue and I got a fucking call back. Wow. That like my was first the shit edition. at the time. That was a groundbreaking show. They were breaking all the rules with camera work and everything else. That was great. So I had uh, I had gone in for Libby Goldstein, great lady, and I read for NYPD Blue, and I got a call back, but I was too nervous. My hand was shaking at the call back. I didn't get it. And then I got an audition a few weeks later. For some fucking TV show on Fox as some Mexican fucking gambler or something. And I ate a bag of dicks. And I had to go all the way up to the Bosco building at Fox. It's fucking out there. It's like an eight mile fucking walk. So I went to read. I had this bum audition. So I'm fucking furious. I'm walking back to the Bosco building. And as I'm walking past the door, a little lady with glasses pops out. And it's Libby. 
And she looks at me and she goes, Joey, are you here for the audition? I guess I was there for a different audition. I was walking past her door. She just happened to open it. I was standing there. I wasn't there for her audition. I didn't even know what the fuck she was talking about. I told her, yeah. She told me to sign in and she gave me a sheet. And I'm reading this sheet over and over and over. And it's just two or three lines. Well, it was the movie Basketball. Yeah, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, but, South Park guy. The dog, I read for it. Nobody said nothing. I walked out of there furious because I had to walk eight miles back to the car. And I didn't book nothing. One day I'm at that fucking hostel. And I hear, Joey Diaz. Joey Diaz, you got a phone call. And I'm like watching daytime television. I go, Joey Diaz, that's me. I go, what? And he goes, you got a phone call. I run downstairs and it's Ken Phillips. And he goes, hey, man, congratulations. You booked that movie, Basketball. And I go, what are you talking about? And they go, you booked it. You're going to work on a movie. You've got the role as a ref. You're going to work for 5500 a week for a couple of weeks. I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? And he goes, here's the address. You got to be there tomorrow at 7. And I went down there. And it was a dream come true, Jack. Dude, you're Jack. you're living in a hostel and d- driving to a movie set. That's amazing. On an audition that just was happenstance, literally. You're not even there for that. No, and I got the job, and I had to join SAG. And I didn't have a dime. I didn't have a fucking dime. So I called Danny Robinson at APA, and I go, Danny, I'm a friend of Doug Stanhope. You know, I knew Danny. And I go, you got to help me. I got this movie, and I don't have the... At that time, it was $1,200 to yeah, join SAG. And they tapped 12, Hartley, uh, it's called. They, they put you right in, but they take that twelve. The first time, they tapped Hartley. The second time, you got to play the play. Oh, really? I, I thought once you were in, you were in. Oh, you no, date, you, oh, okay. The first one is free. We'll let you get a free one. The next one, a commercial, now you movie, TV show. You got to pay. I didn't have no 1250. I called Danny Robinson. He called me back. He goes, I took care of it. The production company's going to pay. I was like, this ain't happening. So I fucking go down there. And the first day, I don't know what's going on. They give me scripts and shit and wardrobe. I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, Ryan. And finally, I get to put it together. You know, I was taking an acting class. I go, okay, I see what I got to do. And every day, I'm a comic, dog. I want to work. I want to get the fuck out of here, whatever we want to do. So I would go down there and ask them, am I working today? They go, no, 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 come back tomorrow. But stay here till we might need you today. But the most thing I remember is the roller skates. They gave us roller skates, roller blades. And one day I said, let me take a box of these. They were like size 14. Nobody's going to know. And I stopped over by Sports Chalet, and they're like, we'll give you a buck 20 for them. <laughs> yeah, they fired. I gave him a pan. I'm like, I'll be back tomorrow, Doug. Every day, I would steal a fucking, I would steal a fucking uh, a pair of roller skates, all right? Every day. The 14s, the 13s. I kept the 12 for me, then I stole the 11s, and I just went backwards. Dog, I didn't even notice it. I was just walking into the trailer, taking a box, and just putting it in my car and going home and stopping at Ski Chalet. One morning, I'm out with Jimmy Two Shoes. We could hook up like on a fucking Saturday night, and we're still going on Sunday. We're still going into Monday morning. He drives me home at 5, and I got to be on the set at 7.30. This is after four or five weeks on the set. Nobody's even talking. I'm just going in there to steal a pair of roller skates every day. Free, <laughs> well, free like lunch. It. I fucking uh, get to the set. And they're like, Joey, clean up. You're first up. I'm drinking rum, vodka. I got my sugar pills in me. I got more cocaine than Columbia. And I got to go fucking shoot. And I remember that by that time, I had even sold my skates. They're like, where are your skates? I go, I haven't had skates in weeks. They stole my skates, and, and then they're out there. All the skates are missing. <laughs> People with a size nine and blisters because they had to put a size seven on and shit. I fucked that setup, dog. And I thought, 
I thought they knew it was me that I bought that roller skates. So when they called me six months later, they're like, hey, you made it to the movie. What name do you want? I'm like, really? I made it to the movie? And then I had to pay a roll. I was going to wear roller skates to the premiere just to bust their balls. But yeah, I was like, yeah. They didn't even invite me to the fucking premiere. I didn't get any. Ro- I had no roller skates. I'm lying to you guys. But I must have stolen 40 sets of fucking. God. There was no fucking roller skates left when I got through that movie. But my daughter's walking in the door. Can we do this again in two weeks? Of course, that's where we're at. Well, hold on. Let me let me just timestamp this. So we we're ended in 1999. We're in 1999. You just wrapped on the basketball, or you've just made it into the basketball movie. That's where we're going to yeah. pick up next time. I love you. Thank you so much. Is I there anything you, you want to promote, plug, anything at all? Just my reef for cocksuckers. Laughing gas at the ice cream shop in Ventura. They got a new weed called uh, Rainbow Ruts. It's 37%. It'll fucking kill you. We got the best bags in the business. This is yours. Yeah. It's All called right. Cocoa. There's five different flavors. Cocoa, Rainbow Ruts, uh, Sashimi, Ooh. Tremendous. And there's another one. I don't What's your favorite? Tremendous. Uh, Rainbow ruts. Rainbow ruts. All right, brother. Stony. Stony. Cotton mouth. All right. Fucking are these all Christian. indicas, sativas? What are they? Indicas and hybrids. All right, great. I love it. I'm I'm gonna go get some. We're gonna make a field trip out there. I love you, brother. I love you too. And uh thank you for doing this. We'll pick it up again. Go ahead. I'm very proud of you. I love you, brother. As always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, RyanSickler.com. We'll talk to y'all next week. Mm-hmm.